to introduce Fatih Elta here, who's a professor in civil and environmental engineering. There's lots of collaboration between our two departments. And uh, Fatih studies land surface processes and how the interaction of regional circulation and precipitation change under uh, uh, climate change. And um, Charney wrote a seminal paper on, on the formation of deserts, and I think you're going to riff off uh, Charney's paper in, mm -hmm. in, in describing your work. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank, thank you very much. You. Thank you, John. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I came to MIT in, in 1988 uh, as a graduate student, and I actually, many of you may not know, but I am a, actually a graduate of EAPS. I, I took so many classes, and I had interactions with many of the faculty then. By then, um, Charney was no longer in the faculty, and Ed Lorenz was around, so I, but I had minimal interaction with him. I, I remember him as a very quiet, humble gentleman that everyone knew that did significant work, but um, he says very little. Unless someone said earlier, Kerry, and till you engage with him in very um, topics of, of strong interest of his. Um, however, I learned a lot about Charney and his work because of the area of interest that I have, which is looking at land surface processes and their role in the climate system. And that would be the focus of what I would be talking about. And, and mainly, um, if this would collaborate here, um, it's not working. Yeah, it's not, it's not inserted there, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So the paper I would like to um, uh, review with you is a paper on the dynamics of deserts and droughts in the Sahel by Charney in 1975. It was published in the uh, Quarterly Journal of the Royal Meteorological Society. And it's based on a memorial lecture on the dynamics of deserts that he delivered at the Royal Society in 1974. And the, in summary of what I would like to talk about, I think that was a very significant paper. This morning I checked you know, the citations for it. It's in the web of science. It's like number one or two among Charney's papers. And um, it, I think it, some of that impact it, it made had to do with that it was the first in, in three aspects of it. It was the first paper to identify and single out the Sahel as the hot spot for land atmosphere interactions. That was even before the 1983-84 drought that happened there. And there have been large amount of work that done looking at the Sahel uh, as, as a place for land atmosphere coupling. Second, it was the first to propose a specific positive feedback between the land surface and the atmosphere, looking at the land surface as the dynamic component of the climate system as opposed to just component that just reacts to variability in the atmosphere. And the third is the suggestion of the possibility of metastable states what I call multiple climate equilibria, that could really result from this positive land atmosphere feedback. And that has been more recent work in my group and by others that really showed that to be the case and showed that Charney was right in, in projecting that could be a possibility. So in the remainder of this talk, I'm going to like hit on these three aspects and show how work that happened for in the 40 years following this paper was, was um, basically consistent with, with, with Charney's predictions. The paper was published in 1975, and some of it has the motivation for it has to do with this early drought that happened in the Sahel in the early 70s. It brought attention, a significant drought that persisted for sev several years. It brought that region to the attention of many people. That was one reason. The other was the emergence at that time of significant data from satellites that revealed the radiative balance of different regions and how they compared to each other. And desert regions emerged as significant, um, uh, significantly different than other regions. And so the paper came following the Ferris Sahel drought and some of the insights were gained from the new observation that came from satellites. So, I'm going to quote directly from the paper. In relation to the Sahel, Charney argued that a reduction of vegetation with consequent increase in albedo in the Sahel region at the southern margin of the Sahara would cause sinking motion, additional drying, and would therefore perpetuate the arid conditions. So in a way, 
is a positive feedback mechanism by which dryness leads to further dryness in that, in that region. 30 years after that, the, 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 the work by Randy Koster from NASA using an aggregate of models, atmospheric general circulation models, identified regions that are supposed to be hot spots for the coupling between the land surface and the atmosphere, and that study confirmed that the Sahara region is actually one of the major areas where that coupling does take place. And it's really a, a phenomenon that to a large extent happens at regions of transition, regions where you have transition from deserts into grasslands, savannas, forests, and oceans. So those transitional regions have been, are now recognized are the regions where you have, um, you have significant coupling. And before all these AGCMs and before all that, Charney in his 1975 paper identified the Sahel, and that was the first time a specific region, one of those regions had been pointed out as a region for significant coupling between the land surface and the atmosphere. In describing the details of his feedback mechanisms, the argument is the following. The high albedo of a desert contributes to a net radiative heat loss relative to its surroundings, and the resultant horizontal temperature gradient induces a frictionally controlled circulation which imports heat aloft and maintains thermal equilibrium through sinking motion and adiabatic compression. And so a desert would feed back upon itself in an important manner. So that's, that's how Charney described his mechanism. And when you look at the map of land cover around the world, you see the region of the Sahel here and the significant desert in North Africa and the Sahel basically at the border of the desert. And so desertification in this region could induce that feedback that he talked about. So the mechanism that Charney talked about in a cartoon is basically if you have a circulation between the ocean and the land surface, bringing moisture and forcing rainfall, desertification at the border could induce a circulation with subsidence and somewhat pushes this original circulation away, resulting in significant drying. So you see that uh, in order to test that, Charney in the same paper actually um, uh, commissioned simulation using the GIS model. And interestingly, Peter Stone, who at that point did not have the connection to MIT, he was working at GIS, was the person who carried those simulations. So these are climate simulations carried 45 years ago, and they were carried by Peter. And you see here in this simulation, there are two sets of simulations. Basically, you have one in which the 14% albedo in the Sahel, and that's the simulation, the original one here. And then the albedo had been increased to simulate what the desertification would do. And you see how that resulted in a reduction in rainfall at the desert border and pushing this circulation further to the, to the south. And so the simulations using the GIS model confirmed the theoretical prediction that came from Charney's theory. However, and this consistent with what I learned this morning, people talking about, you know, Charney and his, um, um, you know, um, high standard of, of academic honesty, he acknowledged in that paper, we do not have an explanation for the location of the ITCZ over the African continent, which in other words, he acknowledged the fact that this circulation, the monsoonal circulation over the region, we did not have a theory for it. And here is, 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 is a depiction of that circulation based on the ERA interim reanalysis data. It's a combination of model and some observations, which are uh, quite limited in that region. And it shows for different months of the year, they show how you know, the monsoon in May and June, located next to the coast, and how it propagates into the land and, and it shows the dynamics of the monsoon circulation. So that circulation, there have been recently advances in simulating the nature of those dynamical interactions. And so here, this is the reanalysis product, and this is some one model here we have in my group, a regional climate model, simulating the progression of the monsoon on, onto the land. One thing you notice when you look at this is that the progression of the monsoon into the land is a nonlinear phenomenon. It happens in a form of a jump. So the convection would be happening over the ocean and then it will suddenly jump over land. Here in terms of geography, the location of the ocean is about six degrees north 
So south of that is an ocean, north of that is land, and about 25, 30, that's where the, the desert is. And so this is, this is a zonally symmetric picture of, of that situation where you have the vertical and you have different latitudes. So the data from satellites and this data from TRIM reveal this nonlinear nature of the progression of the monsoon over land. So you basically have intense convection over the ocean at time scales of May and June, and then suddenly around August, it basically jumps into the land. So it's, it's a nonlinear progression of it, and, and the model succeeds in simulating that feature. And, and the corresponding uh, circulation associated with that is shown here from the model simulation. So this is the Ferris phase, the Ferris peak, this peak here. You see that the circulation is centered at the border between the ocean and the land, upward motion in blue, and, and red is, is, is subsidence. And how the second peak, which is the full monsoon progressing into land, how that basically is characterized with the vertical motion happening around eight or 10 degrees north, and you have a circulation there. So that same um, um, circulation is associated with um, a distribution of the absolute vorticity at the tropopause such that you have local minima corresponding to the Ferris peak and another minima here, you, you know, it needs some convincing, but apparently little minima here that's showing basically associated with the, with the, second, with the second peak. And both of those are associated with distributions of boundary layer entropy or boundary layer moistetic energy such that the progression of the monsoon over land is associated with the movement of the peak of the boundary layer entropy more into the land region. That's all uh, had been described and predicted by some theoretical work that was done here at MIT during the 1990s. So the last aspect of Charney's paper that I would like to touch on is the concept, the interesting concept of metastabilities, which is multiple equilibria. He argued that this feedback mechanism could conceivably lead to instabilities or meta metastabilities in the desert border regions. And that in itself is a very interesting concept. So let's go a little bit back and have some uh, familiarity with the geography of, of this region of Africa. You have a sharp gradient in the distribution of rainfall shown here. Rainfall declines from the coast towards the desert, so you see that. And also you have a distribution of vegetation that mirrors the distribution of rainfall where you have forests next to the coast and you have savanna and then grass and then you have the desert. So here, this is in, if you measure it in terms of net primary productivity, you see a, a similarly sharp gradient. So in a way you could characterize this system in a zonally symmetric way by looking at things only in the north-south direction. And so, oh, sorry. So, um, so this work, this had been uh, studied by Guilin Wang here at MIT, doing her PhD working with me, when she developed a coupled model of the atmosphere and of the vegetation. And what thing about Wang's model is that it's not only the atmosphere that's dynamic, but also the vegetation is dynamic, meaning that as the climate changes, the vegetation state changes. And after she simulated the equilibrium conditions in terms of precipitation and vegetation, she introduced perturbations in the Sahel region by changing the vegetation density. Increasing the vegetation density leads to increasing rainfall, reducing it results in less rainfall. However, what she discovered is that if you perturb the vegetation distribution enough, then the system moved into another equilibria. And so that's what an illustration for a regional climate system that has more than one equilibrium. And in this case, it has three equilibriums. At the same time, Gulen Wang was doing her work here at MIT. A group in Germany led by Martin Clausen at the Max Planck Institute were looking at the same issue and they represented theoretically the dependence of vegetation on precipitation using this continuous line and the dependence of precipitation on vegetation using the dashed line there. And as a result, when you have, when you, the intersection of these two lines provide you with three equilibria, and those three equilibria correspond to these three ones that, that Guling Wang basically discovered. And so with that, you know, this is an example for a region where you have more than one equilibrium in the climate system, 
here represented in this cartoon where you could have fluctuation in one equilibria, and if those fluctuations are large enough, then they could move you into a different equilibria. That actually exactly was shown in this experiment. So if you start the model, uh, you could simulate equilibrium C, equilibrium A, and if you start the model around equilibrium B, perturbation would push you either to equilibrium A or to equilibrium C because it's an unstable equilibrium. So this provides an example for multiple climate equilibrium the coupled land atmosphere system. This theoretical concept, which up to now I was talking about the model, has actually some basis in observations. However, you have to go back thousands of years in observations. The Sahara Desert has a paleo climate that looks very different than what we have now. So during the Middle Holocene, the Sahara was much wetter than it is today. There is evidence from lakes levels in different parts, different data points, different parts of the Sahara, that, and also evidence from human um, uh, settlements that the climate of this region fluctuated at time scale of thousands of years. The latest was an expansion of the desert that happened around 6,000 years ago. The desert expanded by about four to five degrees north. So this provides a test for climate models is to see their ability to reproduce that. And so here, um, Michelle Rizari, working at MIT, used the same model that has the dynamic vegetation, the dynamic atmosphere that I described earlier, and she tried to reproduce the expansion of the desert. And so this is a case in which she starts from the current vegetation at the initial conditions, and then she tries under two different scenarios, one in which you consider vegetation to be static, meaning that you don't let vegetation be a dynamic component of the climate system, and in the other in which you consider vegetation to be a live and dynamic component of the system. So when you include the dynamics of vegetation, she succeeds in simulating an expansion of the desert by about two to two, 2.5 degrees, which is like half of the overall expansion that you see in the paleoclimatic record. The only way she was able to simulate an expansion of the desert border that's in the order of four to five degrees consistent with observation was not only to include the dynamics of the vegetation, but to start from an initial condition that resembles the paleo vegetation that existed 6,000 years ago. So this is in a way, is a case in which the sensitivity to initial condition is not a, a weather feature, but a sensitivity to initial condition at the, for climate, for the regional climate system. So that that's actually connects to what, what the, uh, the concepts of chaos and sensitivity to initial condition, which are usually applied when we talk about weather systems, but in a case in which you have multiple equilibria for the climate system, then the climate question itself becomes, uh, you have significant sensitivity to initial condition, and this case of the Sahel and the paleo climate of the Sahel demonstrate that. So in summary, you know, Charney, uh, in, his, in his seminal paper, he identified the Sahel as a hot spot for land atmosphere interaction. Many researchers who came after him in the last four decades followed that work, and there have been significant amount of research that had been done consistent with that. The first time a positive, specific positive feedback mechanism had been described in his 1975 paper, and that's something that um, had implications as far as metastabilities and explaining the paleo climate for that region. Thank you very much. Any questions for Fatih? Eugenia? Thank you very much for, for this great talk. Uh, yesterday I mentioned that uh, uh, we were inspired by, by Charney's uh, uh, discovery of this mechanism, positive feedback mechanism with the vegetation, but also by a similar uh, positive feedback associated with vegetation, which is, was by Yogi Sur, uh, that that uh, friction uh, show that uh, if you uh, overgraze vegetation, then the friction, surface friction decreases and it also produces uh, 
less uh, da downward motion and less r uh, rain, and, and it, it, it's another similar one. So we did experiments putting uh, f farms of of wind uh, windmills and and the solar panels in the Sahara to and we got a very nice positive feedback with uh, the the large large scale uh, putting in a model uh, large scale uh, farms of of uh, windmills and and solar panels and they both increase the precipitation, especially in the Sahel, very substantially. <laughs> so it agrees very much with what, what you said. Uh, but uh, friction is also a very important <laughs> feedback. Mm -hmm. OK, I, I think in, in Charney's work, he emphasized the albedo and the changes in albedo. When you change land cover, uh, we understand that you change evaporation, you change the boiling ratio, and there are implications as far as moisture and roughness, as you mentioned. So, and that's why I think he used the GIS model, um, because the GIS model has a more uh, complete set of processes, and the projections from that, simulations from that by Peter Stone confirmed his, his theory. Yeah. So Charney, Charney's theory emphasizes a regional interaction on the subsidence but there's another idea kicking around, which, for example, was advanced by Methvin and Hoskins, that most of the subsidence that gives you the desertification is due to remotely forced mm -hmm. uh, uh, circulations. This also shows up in uh, solar geoengineering experiments, where if you do solar geoengineering concentrated in the northern hemisphere, you actually dry the Sahara, the Sahel, quite dramatically. So I was really wondering to what extent this local sort of multiple equi equilibria, local feedback can survive, can sort of fight the, uh, the remotely forced subsidence, which may actually be controlling everything in the end. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, I had one experience with that um, a long time ago with one of my graduate students. She was curious about um, if you could really fight that large scale subsidence by local. So we had a model, a global model, that has dynamic vegetation in it. So we planted the Arabian desert with trees. And so that's exactly like the kind of question you, you know, so because the Arabian desert, there is remotely forced subsidence associated with the Indian monsoon and so on. And so that's, that's a remotely forced. And, and, but so if you plant trees locally, would that be enough to overcome that? that and, and the answer is no. You know, the, the strength of that, the strength of that subsidence is large enough that the trees would die and the increase in precipitation would be not be large enough to induce that. We haven't published that, but, but you could think of within the context of models, you could carry experiments like that. And, and my, my, my guess for most regions, the remotely forced subsidence would, would win. But there may be exceptions. <laughs> <laughs>